This is part 17, the nocebo effect. In your life, your conscious mind only runs about 5% of the show. Okay? The other 95% of your life is governed by the unconscious programming that's running in the background. Okay? Remember the image of the iceberg on one of my previous videos? If you watch my Silent Hill series, I believe in there is the iceberg. That ex It's a great analogy for explaining the difference between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Well, this unconscious programming was mostly set or imprinted into you and I by the time we were seven years old. And odds are that 95% of what you do in your life has already been determined by your unconscious operating system, in a manner of speaking. Our behavior and actions are largely driven by what we believe to be true. Objective facts really don't matter that much. They don't really factor in that much in our lives. After all, we have to choose which facts that we wish to accept in the first place, right? And we choose facts based on what we already believe to be true. So much of what was already imprinted on our psyche at an early age accounts for how we choose what we believe or what we choose as factual, right? Now I'm talking in a general sense on the decision-making that we make in our lives. Uh, for example, who we choose to be romantic with, our friends, the overall course of our lives, right? This doesn't account for scientific decision-making based on the data, right? That's, that's entirely different. But it's not really that incredibly different. If, if you, because there's a certain predisposition to either believing in a certain school of thought or not. And how you choose that definitely has a lot to do with, again, the belief system, the unconscious programming, right? But it, it is separate in a certain sense. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the human psyche. I'm talking about our individual decisions, right? So for example, if we unconsciously believe that we are successful, and this would be a lesson that's unconsciously taught to us by one or both parents at a very early age, then we will feel like we are successful, or we will have this sense within us, deep within our programming, that we are worthy of success, despite any conscious obstacles we may encounter in life. Despite however many times we fail, we will fail our way to an, an, to an eventual success, right? And this can account for the difference between people that are ultimately successful and the people who will encounter an obstacle and then just give up, right? Because they feel unconsciously they're not worthy of success in the first place. And this event that happened, this obstacle that came about is just a confirmation of what they already believe unconsciously right? So if we consciously believe we are successful, and yet unconsciously we betray this by believing the opposite, right? So you start out on a project and you consciously believe this is going to be a success, this is a great idea, etc., right? But unconsciously, you don't believe that. Un unconsciously, you have unconscious programming that's running that tells you that you're not worthy of this success for whatever reason, right? Then, if that's the case, then we will set ourselves upon a course to consciously affirm that we've, what we believe deeply about ourselves and the unconscious and the world will eventually come true. We'll eventually be able to confirm our belief that this wasn't a success for whatever reason, but really it comes down to our belief in ourselves. And that belief is not just believing in yourself consciously, but it's an unconscious inheritance that comes to you from your parents, from your guardians, from the people around you, from your friends, 
etc. This is where this really comes from, right? So our unconscious beliefs about who we are and what we are capable of were instilled in us at a very early age by our parents and family members. So what they believe to be true about themselves is what they imprinted upon us as children. So it is this unconscious belief that we inherit from our parents that is really running the show, at least early on. Now, for people that don't realize this dynamic is happening, they'll go about their entire lives identifying themselves with their conscious mind, right? I would say the majority, I would say 95% of the population believes who they are is the contents of their wakeful conscious mind, right? And if you if you're never shown this this reality of the unconscious actually being in charge, actually running the show 95% of the time, if you're not even aware of this, then you will go through your life believing, you will have this belief, a false belief that your conscious mind is actually in the driver's seat, but it's not. Now, belief is unconsciously passed along from parent to child. And this is passed primarily through behaviors and actions, which are driven by what we or what the parent believes to be true. It's not really sole determination that makes then an accomplished pool skater, for example, it's completely up to the parent's reaction in the first critical moments. This kid steps on a skateboard or the unconscious signals of determination imparted from parent to child or teacher to student. How the parent reacts when the child falls is an unconscious response which determines that if that child is likely to continue learning how to ride a skateboard or if they are going to retreat to a safe place, right? When the child falls, the child will instinctively look to the parent for guidance and for a sense of safety. How the parent reacts to seeing the child fall and skin their knee, for example, is exactly how a young child will learn to react to these situations into adulthood, right? If the parent appears distressed when the child falls, so too will the child be distressed. If the parent, however, encourages the child to get back up, the child will likely mirror the sentiment and step back on the skateboard and give it another try, right? You see this all the time on the playground, I have a nephew, he's going to be four years old soon, he falls down, and especially when he was about two or so, he'd fall down and look up, he'd look to his mother for safety, or if I was with him, he'd look up to me to see how I reacted, right? This is critical to know, especially if you're a young parent, right, or if you just want to understand why it is you believe the things you do and why does you do the things you do, right? Now, like many activities, skateboarding is completely nonverbal. You cannot rationalize simply uh, a belief that you're about to, when you're about to drop into a pool, you can't just rationalize yourself to make this happen, right? There's an unconscious belief that has to be present that you can actually drop in on this pool and not break your neck, right? However, if you have this belief that you will hurt yourself, that you will break your neck, first of all, you will fall, and second of all, you will definitely injure yourself and you will not try this activity again, for example, right? This is a quote from Tony Hawk. This, is, this tells you everything you need to know about this unconscious programming for um, children at an early age. The biggest lesson I learned from my dad is support children even if they're doing something that is unorthodox. So, you know, Tony Hawk's father, Frank, took him to, he was super supportive, but he took him to all of the skateboarding contests that were in the area in Southern California at the time. 
And just by that simple action of showing his son that he believed in what he was doing, even though skateboarding was like this thing that only, I mean, just a handful of people did. It wasn't very popular, not anywhere near the way it was now. I remember when I was a kid growing up skateboarding, being yelled at, being harassed, being threatened, right? Um, All kinds of stuff. And so you can imagine that the signals that Tony Hawk got from his father by his father taking him to all these contests, supporting him, helping him build ramps, helping him do all of these things, that unconscious support was transmitted or that unconscious programming was transmitted from Frank to his son, Tony, right? And this is the primary factor, I believe, why Tony was so successful, right? Because he had a unconscious, unshakable belief in himself, and it was given to him by his father. And his father didn't have to tell him anything, didn't have to verbalize anything. All of that communication was unconscious. So speaking from the metaphysical sense, the unconscious belief that one is wealthy, for example, comes from the parents, not from an abundance of material resources. The unconscious belief that one is poor comes from the parents, not from a lack of material resources. Having said that, there are many wealthy people who are actually quite poor in many other areas of their personal lives. And I've met them. I grew up with them. I can attest to this. (laughs) Just as there exist materially poor people who experience quite a richness in their interpersonal relationships, and this is something I can attest to as well, although the later group or the latter group may experience richness in material resources resulting from the fullness of their relationships, but not always, okay? So what I'm saying is some people who come from families with very loving, very uh, close-knit families, some of those unconscious, some of that unconscious programming can be translated into a successful career because they're good at building good stable, solid relationships with people, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a, not always, but it is oftentimes can be an indicator of someone's success in life, quite simply because of uh, coming from a loving, healthy family, right? But that's not always the case, because you can come from a wealthy family, and you can learn certain unconscious patterns of how to build wealth, or how to read people, or how to get what you want, right? How to figure out ways how to get what you want. That's unconscious programming. And that's 95% of the knowledge, or 95% of the understanding is transmitted non-verbally from parent to child, right? But your life could be on self-destruct in many different other areas. You could have all kinds of deficiencies in other areas, but still be wealthy. However, the unconscious programming imparted to wealthy children from their parents has equipped them with a certain instinct and automatic behaviors which tend towards the acquisition of material wealth in one way or another. Or at the very least, they become accustomed to such things. Now, a wealthy child's other dysfunctions, social dysfunctions, uh, familial love dysfunctions, Uh, There may be many of those, but just like the poor child, his or her unconscious programming is installed depending upon what the parents believe about themselves and the world. So is it any wonder why the message of feeding one's mind with conscious programming is so heavily emphasized in society? If conscious programming only makes up 5%, of your beliefs, of your actions, of your decision-making, right? Could it be that the ones in the know are not telling you something? Something which has been far long, long known before the words of uh, know thyself, 
were etched in stone at the Oracle at Delphi. Something that's been known for a long time. Something which has been lost, and I use that in quotes, lost, but not really, only to be discovered by increasingly smaller groups of people over the course of human history. Such people, which have described, they have been described as pulling themselves, pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, as it were. You've heard this term, right? Someone who came from a very poor family and they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, right? It's another way of describing the successes of people who discover the power of their own inner resources and set upon the task of rewriting their own unconscious programming because that's what's really going on when you hear about someone who came from a poor family right oftentimes there is a way to think or there there's a way there's an unconscious programming of abundance that you can get from your family or there's an unconscious programming of scarcity that you can inherit as a child from your family, right? So if you come from a unconscious programming of scarcity, and then you meet maybe at a younger age or when you're in school or something, you meet some other families that have, they seem to have a unconscious programming or an unconscious belief of abundance. They believe they're enough. They believe there's abundance for them and abundance for everyone. And they act in this way. They, they make choices in accordance with this unconscious belief, right? Then this kid who was poor, coming from a scarcity mindset, scarcity unconscious programming behavior, can look at that and go, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How do I get that? Right? How do I, how do I overwrite the programming? Right? That's basically, that's my interpretation. And when someone picks themselves up by their bootstraps, a lot of times there has to be some unconscious reprogramming or rewriting, right? Today we live in the era of what I call the intelligent idiot. It's an era where the complexity of systems are ramping up at a seemingly exponential pace. There are people in government and on Wall Street who seem intelligent and well-educated, but who appear, uh, they appear able to demonstrate their knowledge of complex systems. They went to university, they have a master's degree or a PhD. They can quickly repeat facts about these systems. They can quickly give you an answer. They can give you an answer, right? And yet they don't examine their own presumptions enough to realize that what they think they understand about this or that complex system is really just a tower of Babel in the making, right? Take, for example, the U.S. monetary system and its relation to the global economy. For all of these seemingly complex, uh, for the seemingly complex system to do with the Federal Reserve and central banking, the reality is that a handful of bankers figured out how to devise a scheme over the long term of many generations in order to trick countries like China into trading actual goods and resources for worthless paper promises backed by nothing of value at all except faith and confidence, right? Talking about the the U.S. dollar, of course. The objective fact is that the U.S. dollar, nor just about any currency in the world for that matter, is not backed by anything of tangible value at all. And yet, this fact does not matter. While it is a fact, it's completely a fact. A dollar, on objectively, is just a piece of paper with some words and numbers on it that has no value in the, in, in, in the objective sense. It has no value whatsoever. It is the belief that it has value that matters, right? It is, it is everyone believing or having confidence that this, um, this dollar has value. It's only belief. It's not a fact. It's just belief, right? 
So what happens if confidence and belief begin to erode? It is belief, after all, which drives human behavior for better or for worse. It is the reason why I believe the placebo effect is known to be at least 30% effective, if not more. It's not the positive thinking per se that gives this placebo effect its power, but more so the belief that this drug or that doctor can heal a certain dilemma or disease, which seems to yield a positive result. It's just this, the belief. Belief gives so much power. Facts, the fact could be you're getting a sugar pill. The fact could be this doctor is not really letting on to you. He's not letting you know that he doesn't really know as much as you think. But the doctor knows that if you come into his office and you believe, you really do believe that he knows way more than he actually does in reality, he knows you're going to get better. So it's probably in the best interest of the doctor to keep that little lie going, right? Conversely, it is the nocebo effect. This is a coin termed in the 60s attributed to one Walter Kennedy. This placebo effect accounts for the negative effects of belief that people endure in their lives. If someone believes themselves to be deserving of negative consequences, then the nocebo effect will very likely factor into the consequences of this belief. It is the unconscious programming at work which sets events in reality into action. Whether this is consciously understood or not really doesn't matter. This is just the way it works, right? So, if our unconscious programming is locked in by the age of seven, then what are we to do for the rest of our miserable lives? What hope do any of us have, especially those of us who were born into a negative environment and family situation? Are we just hopelessly imprisoned by our biology? Of course not. We are the co-creators of our reality after all. We are part of our existence, and the all of our universe really is within us at the very same time. We are living in this paradox, after all. We do have some say in this. The good news is we don't have to be trapped in an unconscious prison. There are two key ways in which we may counteract our negative unconscious programming and begin to override it with something that will help improve our lives. The key point to understand about unconscious programming is that it functions at the nonverbal level. This entire series, Word Magic, is ironically trying to get you to come around to the idea that most of communication, including words and language and thinking, right, we tend to think of that as that is where things are happening, that is where my identity is, that's who I am, but none of that's real. None of that. That's that's 5% of the picture, right? 95% of what's driving your decisions, your beliefs, 95% of everything manifest in our civilization, in, in the reality that we live in every day. 95% of that is due to unconscious programming, right? So the key point to understand about unconscious programming is that it functions at the nonverbal level, but we can get at it from the verbal level, from we can begin, at least, begin to get at it, begin to reprogram it at the level of the conscious level, uh, at the conscious level. And while there is something to be said about positive thinking and using positive self-talk, comprised of both inner and outer dialogues, right? The real transformation will only occur if the following two key areas are activated, okay? So there is a channel 
that you can use from your conscious mind. You, there's conscious practices that you can set in in motion for yourself and then let the unconscious mechanisms work and let them rewrite, right? This doesn't mean that you can consciously change the unconscious. That's that's foolish. You're not going to that's not going to happen. But what you can do is you can if you're if you're aware enough, if you're conscious enough to to accept the the fact that 95% of your being is running the show or I should say your unconscious is 95% of of your life's decisions. If 5% of your conscious mind, the, the, the part that's watching this presentation right now, can get on board with that, then you can set things in place, you can set things in motion that will start to rewrite your unconscious programming. The first key area has to do with something known as theta wave brain function, which accounts for much of our human learning. From birth to roughly age seven, we are largely in a theta wave state. I believe there's five different uh, wave states that we understand so far in the human mind or what we describe as wave, uh, wave states. And the theta wave state is, all five of these are happening in, in, in the human mind, but the theta, theta wave state is most prominent uh, from ages um, one to seven. This theta wave state is associated with constantly observing, learning, and absorbing, right? So kids are just like sponges. You're just everything you're just pulling in. You don't know anything, right? Your first seven years, heck, your first probably 20 years, you don't really know anything. Um, and by the way, the the mind itself, the the physical human brain, doesn't stop growing until around age 24, 25, okay? So you're, you're really being imprinted. A large part of your imprinting is through age seven, but you can continue this imprinting um, well into, in, until the time that your, your brain is um, fully developed by your mid-20s. But the critical age is uh, definitely by five, six, seven years old is the most critical for a lot of our behavior, a lot of our beliefs. So as our body grows, the foundations of our neural networks are being set, okay? Much of our personality and the outcome of our lives, in a general sense, are mapped out within the first decade of our lives. Another way to in induce this theta brainwave state later in life is through hypnosis. Not the kind of hypnosis used as some sort of parlor trick, right? You might have seen uh, seen something on TV or attended an event where everyone's just having a laugh with hypnosis. This guy thinks he's a dog, and this lady, she thinks she sees aliens, you know, that kind of stuff, right? But real uh, meaningful hypnosis with a goal in mind, right? The kind of hypnosis that you'd get by a licensed and trained hypnotherapist, for example. Also, there's something known as auto-hypnosis, which is available. And it is a way to use suggestive audio playing while we sleep. Mileage may vary when it comes to auto-hypnosis. Um, I haven't fully researched this, but having experienced hypnosis from a licensed therapist myself as an adult, I can certainly say that it was effective. I was able to successfully reprogram the specific belief that I wanted to overwrite. Having said that, there is another factor which needs to be in place if you want any new programming to stick with you, right? After I was hypnotized, I had a new sense of, of myself in, in, in the way that um, I felt different and my reactions were different, but I, but I was also instructed that I needed to keep practicing, keep practicing, keep reinforcing this new implanted belief. 